Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Luke, thank you so much for leading those songs. I appreciate that. I didn't tell Luke what my sermon topic was. I don't believe I did. But I think those were appropriate. So thank you. My name is Jerry, if you don't know me. Uh, I am not Russell. Russell asked me to fill in for him today. Him and Sarah are traveling, I believe, to Colorado. So if we uh, could, let's remember them in our prayers as they travel. Speaking of traveling, have you ever heard of white line fever? Have you ever experienced white line fever? <clears throat> Some of you maybe, maybe have and don't realize it. White line fever is also known as highway hypnosis. It is an altered state of mind which a person can drive a vehicle great distances and respond correctly and safely in the expected manner and have absolutely no recollection of driving. Has that ever happened to you? I know it's happened to me. Travis says no. I see some heads nod hands. I know it's happened to me. Uh, when I first moved up into Omaha from Bellevue in the apartment complex that I lived in, I had to take, uh, I worked down at the base, still do. I had to take I-680, to I-80, to Highway 75 in order to get to the base. And back then, the speed limits at that time was 60 miles an hour on each one of those roads. So I'm a big advocate of using my cruise control, uh, which is difficult for me right now because the cruise control on my current vehicle does not work. Uh, but I'm a big advocate of using cruise control. So in the mornings on my way to work, I would get on 680, set my cruise control, and just drive. Every now and then, my mind would start to drift, and before I knew it, I was at work. Now, I thought I had some sort of superpower where I could teleport. I was a little disappointed when I found out that I didn't have a superpower, that I had experienced white line fever or highway hypnosis. It's a very unique phenomenon where your conscious mind and your subconscious mind can focus on two separate things at the same time. Your mind could be thinking of something completely different. It's not on driving. I could make an interconnect change from I-80 to Highway 75 and drive all the way down to the base and not even remember the drive. It's actually a rather scary if you think about it to be operating a, a three or 4,000 pound vehicle and not remembering how you, how you drove, where you drove, how you got where you're at. To go from one point to another and not remember the drive in between. It's actually pretty scary. But the phenomenon about it is, is that you're, you're driving safely. You're making the correct lane changes. You're driving the correct speed. You're making the correct uh, transition from one highway to another. So that's the amazing part about it. Another thing that's scary, this microphone's in my way, Travis. Okay, need a bigger podium. Another thing that's scary is that uh, some Christians do the same thing with their spiritual life. They can go for years and years as a Christian and not actually go anywhere spiritually. Not growing as a Christian. As they get closer to their destination, they ask themselves, how did I get here? I don't remember the drive. 
The question that I have for you this morning is, are you ready? Are you ready for judgment day? Is anyone ever really ready? I think it can be. There's probably four ways that you can answer this question. Yes. No. I don't know. Or I hope so. Now, three of those answers can be pretty scary if you think about it. A while ago, I had read a statistic that 40% of Christians, 40% of Christians do not even believe that Satan exists. That's Christians. 40% of Christians do not believe that Satan exists exists. I think that's truly amazing. And uh, I would think that if they don't believe that Satan exists, that they would probably also believe that hell doesn't exist. And I can't even imagine what that number would be for the non-believer. If 40% of Christians do not believe that Satan exists. In 1864, a French writer by the name of Charles Baudelaire wrote, The devil's finest trick is to persuade you that he does not exist. That was written in 1864. His greatest trick is to persuade us that he does not exist. And with the stat of 40% of Christians believing that, I would say that he's doing a good job. Back to my question. Are you ready for Judgment Day? We're going to look at some scripture this morning. We're going to find some yeses, some noes, and some I don't knows. Our first scripture this morning is... In the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 12. Matthew 25, verses 1 through 12. This is the parable of the ten virgins. Verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be, be, will be comparable to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flask along with their lamps. Now when the bridegroom was delayed, delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom! Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us. And you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. In this parable, the kingdom of heaven is compared to a wedding feast where the bridegroom is Christ, and the ten virgins the invited guests are believing Christians. From my understanding, they all knew the bridegroom and wanted to meet him. However, not all entered the wedding feast with the bridegroom. 
Apparently, there were some certain requirements that the virgins had to meet in order to enter the wedding feast. Scripture calls the five who ran out of oil foolish. From reading the scripture, they had lamps, so they must have known what these requirements were. Yet they didn't do what was required of them. And when they asked the prudent virgins for some of their oil, they said no. I'm kind of amazed that at this time of night they weren't out to, I know it's a parable. I get too literal sometimes when I'm, my wife's nodding her head. I get too literal sometimes. What oil salesman is going to be open this time of night? That's, that's my original thought. But I, I think I'm missing the point there. Uh, the point is that they weren't ready. Scripture tells us that there are things required of us if we want or have the desire to go to heaven. These are things that we must do on our own. And from this parable, we see that no one can do it for us. We have to do it on our own. Our next scripture is going to be in the book of Revelation. Chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. Chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. To the angel of the church of Laodicea, write, the amen and the faithful and true witness, the beginning of of the creation of God says this. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, I have become wealthy and I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. In verse 15, the Lord tells this church, I know your deeds. And... They are, in verse 16, they're lukewarm. In verse 17, it tells us that it was because of their wealth that they had a need for nothing. That was a reason that they were lukewarm in their deeds. They were wealthy. So they figured that they didn't have to do anything. They became lazy, my words, they became lazy and content in their wealth and that affected their deeds. It was because of this attitude that they had that they were actually, that actually made them wretched and miserable and poor and blind, emphasis on blind, and <clears throat> naked. Their wealth blinded them into thinking that they were okay with God, and that God was okay with them, but apparently he wasn't. Now, I'm not saying that wealth is a bad thing. I know several wealthy people that do a lot of good with their money. So it's the attitude that we have with that wealth. Our last scripture that we're going to look at this morning is in the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. This is the parable, of the story of the Good Samaritan. I really enjoy uh, this parable. There's a lot of lessons to be taught, to be, to be learned from it. <clears throat> we're actually going to start in verse 25. And the lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit 
eternal life. Verse 30, Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down on that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him, and he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will return and repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into, into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy to him. Then Jesus said, go and do the same. As I said, I, there's a lot, of, a lot of lessons in this one story. But I'd like to focus on the priest and the Levite. Now, Scripture doesn't come out and tell us why these two didn't stop to help the injured man. You would have thought that if anyone would have stopped, it would have been these two. The two who were men of God. Two spiritual men. Two men who had just gotten done teaching and preaching and or working at the synagogue. And they were on their way home. They really didn't have any real excuse for not stopping, but they chose not to. Now, they didn't have to go to the extent that the Samaritan did. They could have done something, but they chose to do nothing. Now, in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 22, it says, But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers. Delude who delude themselves. Delude means deceive. They deceive themselves. Now, there's a common thread with each one of these passages of Scripture that we looked at this morning. The five virgins who ran out of oil, the church of Laodicea, and the priest and the Levite. The way I see it, none of them were ready for Judgment Day. I have one more story for you before I close. It's going to be a quick sermon. Got here early. Uh, Many years ago, like 18 years ago, I was over at uh, the Sunny Slope Church of Christ, where I worshipped at that time. And a family was getting ready to move from an apartment complex into their house. And uh, as custom has it, you ask the congregation for uh, assistance, and they did. So the move was supposed to be on a uh, Saturday. That previous Wednesday night, I was there for Bible class and I was talking to uh, one of the older gentlemen that were there. And I asked him, I said, are you gonna go and, and help them move on Saturday? And he kind of replied with a chuckle and he says, no, I think I'd just be in the way. And I told him, I said, no, I said, you could be, you know, even if you were to go and just hold the door, you'd be helpful. Well, Saturday morning came and he was there. He showed up to help this family move. Now, this family, they lived in a secured neighborhood. You know, the ones where you, you drive in and the, the gate opens up and then it closes behind you. And it opens and closes as you as you exit. 
And the same thing happens uh, at the buildings. At the front door, the doors lock behind you after you leave, and you need a security code, code to get back in. Well, this gentleman was there, and he helped out. He didn't carry a single box that day, but he did hold the door. And I was grateful that he did because every time we walked out with a box to go to the truck, the door closed behind us and it locked us out. I was thankful and grateful that he was there to let us back in. Even though he didn't carry a single box that day, he was probably the greatest help of anyone that was there. And I think it's amazing that just four days prior to that, he thought he'd be in the way. And it turned out that he helped out the most just by holding a door. Now, if you ever helped anybody move before, <clears throat> you know that if someone's holding a door, it's a great help. Our deeds don't have to be spectacular or grand. They just need to be helpful. If you feel that your spiritual life has been on a cruise control, you need to regain control. As for my question, are you ready for Judgment Day? You can answer that by being doers of the word and not just hearers. Don't become comfortable in your spiritual life. Don't put it on cruise control. Look for and find opportunities to grow. I thank you for this opportunity this morning. And in closing, I'd like to offer an invitation to anyone that may have a need. Uh, please let us know what it is. Uh, we can help out in any way that we can. Uh, let's do that as we stand and sing.